I would say the starting point for where things started to to get to a place where you saw this confrontation being inevitable, it was the drafting of Jimmy Garoppolo in 2014. That night, Bill Belichick cited Tom's age, his contract status, and he said, I'd rather be early than late at the quarterback position. And ever since that point, Brady was worried that Garoppolo was going to take his job at some point. And, and clearly, Belichick fell in love with Jimmy G as a young player. He really likes him, I think, as a person, loves him as a prospect. And Brady felt that. Now, he elevated his game. He outplayed the plan. He outperformed the machine, the Belichick machine, that basically nudges out and pushes out every made man in, in Foxborough over the years. You know the, the long parade of players who've been great for them, who've been moved out early. And, but Brady forced Belichick to trade Garoppolo. I think later on uh, last season, Belichick sort of regains control of the relationship by cutting team access to Alex Guerrero, Tom's business partner, Yep. And life coach, right? Fitness coach. And then Brady regains control of the relationship in the offseason by becoming the only starting quarterback not to report to OTAs. He, out of 32, 31 reported, he was the one who didn't. So there was a standoff. My sources told me, Stephen A., in late March, as late as late March, he was still considering not playing for Belichick and stepping away from the game. We talk about Brady still considering not playing for Belichick and the New England Patriots because, and stepping away from the game because of his frustrations. What about the notion that Belichick might have been frustrated? You just articulated mm -hmm. how Brady won the war between him and Garoppolo because Belichick didn't want to trade Garoppolo and ultimately was forced to do so. You articulated that process. Then tr Brady doesn't show up for training camp after, you know, uh, Belichick had banned his life coach, his fitness coach, Alex Guerrero, from there. Uh, but ultimately that was modified or overturned, rather. Clearly that could not have happened without the blessing of owner Robert Kraft. What about Belichick walking away? What about Belichick saying, I don't need this, and going to coach for somebody else? Have you heard anything as to whether or not that was possible? I think it, he was frustrated at the end of, of last season, Stephen A., particularly the morning of the AFC Championship game against Jacksonville. Robert Kraft was on the NFL Network, and there was a quote. I think Willie McGinnis might have asked him the question mm -hmm. about the, the Seth Wickersham report, reports of, of conflict and turmoil within and, and Kraft gave an answer and talked about everyone needs to keep their egos in check. Well, I was told by someone who knows Belichick well that, that Bill took that personally. He took that as a shot at him, and he did not like that at all. Now, uh, somebody close to Robert Kraft told me it was not intended as a direct shot at uh, Belichick, yeah. that it was a general comment, whatever. But, but listen, I, I think Bill Belichick is a young 66. I think he was very frustrated at times last year with the way things played out. It's funny. We're talking about last year as if it were a disaster. They went to the Super Bowl again. They lost a one-possession game, and their quarterback threw for over 500 yards, and people talk about it as an unmitigated train wreck. Well, the reason why, Bill, let me interrupt you there, Ian. The reason why I would go that route is because you decide, if you're Bill Belichick, to, to, to bench a cornerback right. that you have played 97.8% of the snaps during the regular season and 100% of the snaps during the uh, uh, postseason, I'm thinking that might be a good reason why people were looking at Bill Belichick a bit soft. And, that, and that's a fair reason. I think everyone on that team, I, I can't say everyone, but a lot of players – felt the way Danny Amendola felt, what he expressed to uh, Mike Reese about just being confused and, and angry about that situation. And Bill Belichick has done a lot of unconventional things in big games. This was an unconventional thing that he did at the start of the game by benching Butler. I think he had a plan. Obviously, at halftime, that plan wasn't working. And to me, you understand this is the greatest coach ever. He did something unconventional. He's done it in the past in Super Bowls. Okay, but at halftime, when it's clear it's not working, and basically you've got an hour at the Super Bowl <laughs> practically to make halftime adjustments, how he didn't go back to Butler in the second half and instead went to Batamosi, who missed, to me, maybe the biggest tackle in the game or one of the biggest, that is where I think you can really hit him for not going to Butler in the second half. We're talking to the great Ian O'Connor, author of the new book, Belichick, The Making of the Greatest Football Coach of All Time. He's right here with yours truly, Stephen A. on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. With all of that being said, Ian, I know you well enough and long enough to know you're not just an exceptional writer. You're also an exceptional reporter. Thank you do you. your homework. You know what you're talking about. You do your research, et cetera, et cetera. I'm wondering right now, as, as we look at these New England Patriots, if you had to venture to guess – who would be going from New England first, Belichick or Brady? I would say probably Brady, although I think they're both, Stephen A., going to be around for a long time. It might be a little bit of a race to see who, who's out of there first but or who can last longer. I, I think that Brady's looking at 45. I talked to him last year 
on the phone for an ESPN piece where I brought up 46, 47, 48, even 50. At some point, some athlete is going to prove he can play at a competitive level at age 50, right? And, and maybe Tom Brady's that person. He did. Well, some would argue George Foreman did it, but okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I, how, right. how old was George when he beat Michael Moore? I, I, I don't know. I think was, was it like 48, 49? Okay, I, I think 50. so. But, Bernard tried, but he ran in a, uh, he ran in a couple of people. Right. It's going to look Sergey Kovalev. Right. I, well, I love your stuff on boxing, by the way. I'm a, I'm a big you. boxing guy. But uh, so in team sports, Brady, if he ever got to 50, obviously would be the first significant team sport athlete in America to do that. And I don't think that's going to happen. Neither but, we, do I. but we talked about 46 and 47 being very realistic. So I think Belichick is a really young 66. He looks like he still has a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. He loves what he does. He might coach till he's 73. Yeah. I know in the past he said he's not going to do that. He's not going to be Marv Levy, but I think he will. But last question to you, because as you pointed out, Belichick is a control freak. He likes to control mm-hmm. the narrative, like most great coaches, him, Nick Saban, and others. They want to control the narrative. They want to, if they can't control something, they don't really want to be a part of it. Well, doesn't the trade of Jimmy Garoppolo, doesn't the reemergence of Alex Guerrero, the fitness and life coach, prove that the level of institutional control that Belichick is accustomed to having, particularly in New England, no longer exists? And if so, what would be the incentive for him to stick around? Well, I, I guess he could have even walked away this offseason if he really felt that strongly about it. He didn't do that. I think he loves the game too much. He was not happy about having to. He'd get another job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be pretty easy, right? Right. But uh, he didn't. And I think he's going to retire in this job. I could see him maybe, Stephen A., becoming the president of the Patriots, and then Josh McDaniels takes over – 